Okay. So, so as a business owner, uh, the mere fact that you are just the business owner can give you legitimate power or positional power to exercise over your employees. Yeah? A CEO, by mere virtue that you are appointed a CEO of a company, it gives you positional power over the, the staff of the, of the business. Right? So that's legitimate power or positional power. It's just conferred. You may not be a leader, but you may have power, right? positional power, by mere virtue of being appointed to that position. Right? Then we speak of referring power. Right? This is power that comes from the ability of individuals to attract others and build their loyalty. Right? Very often we see in farming operations, you may have the owner, you may have the, the leader, I mean the farm manager, or you, and then you have the, the workers. Very often, someone within the farm workers may emerge with referring power. There's individuals that have the ability to attract others and build loyalty. Very often, they are the ones that speak on behalf of the farm workers. So they may not have positional power by mere virtue of their position, but because of their ability to influence others and build loyalty, they will have referring power, which in some cases can even be more powerful than your positional power as the owner of the farm. Right? So always bear that in mind that you may have positional power by being the farm owner, uh, but you may not have absolute power over what happens in the operations of that farm because some of those employees may have referring power. Right? That's a point to always think about. Right? Then we speak of expert power. This is by virtue of a person's skills and knowledge. So you may have a person who has more skills and knowledge than others within the group. Um, then others would look up towards that person as someone that has skills and knowledge that they don't have, right? As someone who has power over them by mere fact that they may need to go for assistance to that person for technical knowledge. That gives them the power over uh, the people that have less skills and knowledge. So in our cases, our farm experts, you know, our farm managers who may have more experience uh, than, for example, even the positional power of the owners of the farm. So just always think about how that works, those power dynamics in your own operation. You may again have positional power because you own the farm, but your farm manager being the expert um, in farming operations will have expert power, which again may be even more than your positional power. Right? And then we speak of reward power. It comes from the ability to confer value material. So this again, he who controls the rewards has the power. Right? Then cohesive power, right? very important. This talks to the threat of application of sanctions or negative consequences. Again, this is the person who has the ability to punish someone right? or to confer negative effects on somebody can have cohesive power to force them to do things. Right? Uh, cohesive power, think about it as a good thing or a bad thing in your operation. Uh, would you be very successful only with cohesive power where you're always threatening your employees either to uh, I don't know, to um, not give them bonuses or cut their jobs or their time um, if they don't do what they need to, to be done uh, and then they just do it because they want to avoid the negative consequences. So think about that power dynamics if that works for your business, right? Then we speak of informational power. So informational power comes from access to facts and knowledge. So the person that has information is power. You know, the, the whole uh, scenario of knowledge is power. Similarly to that. So if I have information that certain people don't have, uh, I may appear to know more or to be wiser. Uh, and people generally go to that person to try and get knowledge or to 
questions and answers. So that's what informational power typically uses in terms of that dynamic. Um, I remember when we were younger and we would visit our grandparents in the rural areas, um, uh, they didn't have access to, to newspapers or maybe to, to reading material. So in terms of informational power, they would always look uh, towards us, the younger people, then um, in terms of we knew what was happening out there in terms of we had access to the information. Similarly, in your own business, remember your farm laborers, for example, may have specific information that you don't have as the owner who has the legitimate oppositional power. Right? So these sources of power, the key thing we must take out or key take out here is power will reside in most or almost any level within the organization or within the farm. It can reside with you as the owner or with you as the farm manager or with you as the expert or even the laborers. Remember, referring power, informational power. So never think that power only resides at the top. Power can manifest throughout the organization. All right. Happy? All right. Power tactics. Okay. What are power tactics? All right. So we speak of behavioral tactics, right? So it can be soft or hard. Soft tactics take advantage of the relation between the person and the tactic and the target. Right? So think about that, right? Um, do you use the fact, okay, so soft, soft tactics take advantage of the relationship between the person and the tactic and the target. So this relationship can be between yourself and your employees, right? Yourself. So you can say by mere fact that you are my employee, right? This is the power dynamics that exist, right? Rational tactics. Right, rational tactics uh, of influence make use of reasoning, logic, and objective judgment. Okay, so in terms of our take home today, let's read more on the last two, right, in the manual, and let's see if they apply to what we do and how we apply them to what we do. Right. Okay. So those are power tactics. Okay, so we've 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 touched a, a bit on on what ethics is and what power I mean what what power is, and what um, uh, power dynamics are. Right. So now we're going to move on to ethical leadership. Right. So what is ethical leadership? What is ethics in the first place? Right. So scholars have defined ethical leadership. Right. So they've said ethical leadership. Okay, it talks to behaving according to a set of principles and values that are recognized by the majority as the sound basis for common good, right? What are we saying? We are saying you behave according to how people are expected to behave, right? How they're expected to behave by the majority. What is known as good leadership, right? So that's ethical leadership. Do you conform to ethical leader? Do you behave according to the standard norms of good values, right? Values and principles, right? That the majority say this is good for the common good. It works best for everyone, right? So think about it. Are you an ethical leader in your own perspective, right? Ethical leaders can inspire those around them to behave ethically. Do you influence others to behave ethically? When they look at you, do they then say, we need to do things for the common good? We need to operate in terms of normal good standards? Right? Think about that. Because right? this is essential for credibility and reputation. Whenever you do something, right? there's always the question. There is always the question whenever you do something. You must always ask yourself, right? If if people were to recognize or see me doing what I'm doing behind closed doors, 
would they still be happy? Or if I was to be asked to do it with everyone watching, would I still do it? That's the test normally for ethical behavior. Right? What are the elements that define ethical leadership? We talk of honesty, right? Are you honest? Are you worth of trust, right? We talk of justice, right? Do you treat everyone fairly with fav no favoritism, right? So in your business, do you treat your relatives that work for you the same as your ordinary employees? Right? Is everyone treated equally? Respect, right? Do you respect your farm laborers? Right? Here we, we speak of how what your relationship is with your stakeholders, right? We speak of integrity. Right? Integrity talks about your values, right? Do you walk the talk, right? Are your actions aligned and consistent, right? The answer you give to, to Peter is the same answer you give to Paul for the same thing, right? Responsibility, right? Accepting to be in charge, embracing the power and duties that come with it, right? Are you a responsible leader? Do you take accountability of your actions, right? Transparency, lastly. You know, are you clear in your communication with regards to, you know, you you what you say is what it is. You do not speak in 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 windows or, you know, beat around the bush. Or when you say jump, you mean run. You know, you must be transparent, right? There must be no confusion of what you mean when you say something, right? So, think of these elements, right? Look at yourself. As a leader, right? Do you um, abide by these aspects? Is it something that you are aware of? If not, you know, are you really an ethical leader? You know, let's think about that. You know, as we, um, you know, lead our businesses. So let's say you've you've seen that some of these areas I don't really, you know, I'm not really transparent you know, at times maybe i'm not fair you know how can you improve your ethical skills right so choose your ethical business partners choose wisely so whoever you work with right remember your the company you associate with normally says a lot about you right so choose who you work with choose who associate yourself with right make your values visible right so people must know what your values are, what is important to you, right? What do you stand for? They need to know that, right? And your values should be a reflection of your behavior. So you, once you have those values, you must live by those values. You can't have values that are just on paper, but you don't leave them. Yeah, very often you work in an organization that you know, displays nice values on their reception, but in the paper for the wrong reasons you know you've got litigation for the wrong reason so always live by values right never ask an employee to act against agreed rules right? the rules are in place for a reason and there's others that we have on the slide which i urge you to go through so that you understand the aspects you know, that can make you improve your leadership your ethical leadership skills, right? Um, you know, as you, as, you, as you operate in your business. Um, again, you know, on the chat, you know, think about these aspects. If there are any other aspects that we may have left out or have been left out here, um, let's hear them. You know, let, let's hear what people are saying with regards to what they think is is areas that should be considered for ethical um, leadership skills right? uh, bear in mind some some aspects you may have some you may not have okay so that's enough of ethics uh, our next module that we'll look at is the different leadership styles are we doing on time? We should be good. Okay. 
module two, leadership styles. So what do we need to, to achieve? So by the end of this module, we need to understand the theories of leadership, right? And how leadership influenced men. So this is historically where these leadership styles came from, right? Uh, we need to understand the different types of leadership, right? There's something called transactional, transformational, authentic, right? We may not touch on all of them, uh, but I, I urge you to read the detailed manual that talks to most of these aspects, right? Okay, leadership styles, <laughs> right? Okay, so what, what are these leadership styles, right? Um, authoritarian leadership style, that's the one we'll start with. So this allows a leader to impose expectations and define outcomes, right? So as a leader, you tell your the people you're leading this is what i expect from you and this is the outcomes that i expect right so people know what they need to do right a one person show can turn out to be successful in situation when a leader is the most knowledgeable person right so this works if you are the one that knows the most because remember this is one way Right? You're not getting any feedback from the people that follow you. You are just saying, this is what I need, and this is what I need by way. Right? Again, think of the power dynamics here. How are you using power to lead under the authoritarian leadership style? Always link this to the power dynamic. Right? So in your individual capacities, what power dynamic is associated with the authoritarian leadership style. Okay. Participative leadership, right? Participative already. Remember, authoritarian, me only, telling you what to do. Participative, okay, interaction, right? Rooted, so we speak of democracy or theory, working together, com communal decision making, right? The essence is to involve team members, right? Again, power dynamic. Which power dynamic are you? Are we using power positively or negatively? The cohesion, right? Think about the power dynamics. Again, the two styles are, are contrasting. We've only looked at the two very contrasting styles. One that involves me just telling the group what to do. Right? As a leader, I just tell you this is what I need and this is how I need it. Or the second one, where I consult. I consult the people that, that, that I lead. Uh, we make a democratic decision. They're involved in the decision. Right? Each one is its own advantage and disadvantage, as well as each one is its own place. Right? You may see certain operations it may not be, be prudent or practical or effective to apply the, either the authoritarian or the participative. It just depends. So always look at your own organization. What works for you may not work for me. Then we've got others like your delegative leadership, right? As the word suggests, you are delegating to others. Then we have transactional, we use transaction, okay? I give you this, you give me that. Then we have transformational, right? Where you are inspiring, you know, charisma. Um, you inspire the followers. Then they also follow your vision, right? You see a lot of churches with transformational leaders, right? They have a vision, or do they have transactional or delegated, right? You see. Um, so what type of a leader are you? Just look at those questions we have and just in one word, one line, just type what, what, what kind of a leader you think you are. Okay. Right. Five core principles every leader should adopt. So depending on which leader you are, or, you know, it doesn't really matter which one, um, we, 
researchers come out with principles that every leader should adopt. So leaders model the traits and be so leaders model the traits and behaviors they expect from others. So again, you need to drive an outcome. Remember when we spoke of power, you need to get others to act in a particular way, right? So because you need to do that, you need to treat everyone with respect, manage conflict, and be good and be a good listener for you to be able to model the traits and behaviors that you expect from others, right? Leaders share the vision of where the farm is going with everyone on the farm team, right? So leaders passionately believe in their vision and inspire others to join. So you need to be passionate as a leader about what is important to you, what your vision is, what your value is, right? And through your leadership style, you need to then inspire others, right? So when you just look at the first two, and then you look at the last slide of different leadership styles, right? which leadership style do you think is the best? When you just look at what the core principles that you should have, right? You should challenge the status quo. You must not be stuck in the past and are always looking for better ways to do things, right? Dynamic, right? Always looking forward and not backwards, right? The fourth dynamic, the principle, leaders don't command and control every detail. Remember, we said power can reside in various levels within an organization, right? So if a farm is going to grow, there isn't enough time in a day to manage everything. Instead, they coach, mentor, and ultimately create self-managing collaborative teams. Then leaders have a heart and it shows with how they encourage and motivate everyone around them. So when you look at these aspects, which of these leadership style right, would you think is the best or encompasses most of these dynamics? Right. Okay, let's move to the next module, right? Power. Remember we spoke of power? Now we need to see or touch base on the dynamics of power and leadership, right? So there's four dimensions that we'll look at with regards to dynamics of power, right? So firstly, power opens conflict or debate, right? The first dimension of power is about the direct control of resources to influence decision outcomes and the ability to mobilize these resources. So because power influence decisions and allocation of resources, it will then always open conflict or debate on how resources will be allocated right? and the mobility, mobilization of these resources. So always know power will always open or initiate conflict or debate about resources. Right? The second dimension is power enables you to control the rules of the engagement. Right? Those with power are able to control the agenda or the decision processes. Right. With power, you're able to say, this is what must be done. This is the decision that must be made. Right. The third of dimension, it controls what is truth. Remember, those with power are able to disseminate information. We spoke of power and information before. Right. And because people look towards the people with power, they can control what is true because what they say may be taken as true, right? right? We talk of legitimate the status quo of power through cultural and normative assumptions. Power is used to manipulate people's perceptions. Right? This is power not being used in an ethical way. So it can be used to control the truth or to control what is 
seen as the truth, right? And then the fourth dimension it cannot be destroyed, it can only be redistributed. Remember, we mentioned power cannot be owned before, right? You cannot destroy it, can only redistribute it. It will always be there. Right? So those are the dynamics. So just take time to see how this affects you, either as a leader or as someone who's following uh, others. Right? I think one area that we've seen is power can, or oh, not power, leadership can be positive or negative. Right? We spoke of advantages of different types of leaders, of leadership styles. So in your groups, right, just disguise the dark side of leadership, the negative impacts of leadership. Right? We'll just give you five minutes, we'll put you in, in the groups, and then each person just discusses, or I mean, as a group, just discuss you know, the dark side of leadership, the negative impacts of leadership, when leadership goes wrong. Okay. Right. We will now move to module four. Module four talks to emotional intelligence. Right. What is emotional intelligence? Right, so we'll first start by just defining what emotional intelligence. I know in conversations, you normally hear this guy doesn't have emotional intelligence, you know, you don't have emotional intelligence, or you're too emotional. Um, you know, what is this emotional intelligence or EQ that we talk about? So, emotional intelligence is the ability to understand, use, and manage own emotions in a positive way to relieve stress, communicate effectively empathize with others, overcome challenges and diffuse conflict. So there's a lot of words in here, right? Let's break it down, right? Firstly, ability to use and manage own emotions in a positive way, right? Own emotion, own feelings, right? Remember, as a leader, if you appear in front of people, your emotion or how you handle yourself can affect how they respond to you, right? Very, very, very important. When you look at leaders, look at leaders in your own community. What is it that attracts you to them or say, my leader? More often is how they carry themselves, how they present themselves to you. you know, are they confident when they're in front of you? Do you feel we are in good hands when they speak to you? Right? When they address a crowd, do they whip up the right emotions? Do they get people to rally behind them, right? And then look at yourself as a leader. How do you use emotions to get people to rally behind you? How do you use emotions to lead? Okay. So we speak of emotional intelligence, right? Emotional intelligence is commonly defined by four attributes. There's what we call self-management or the ability to to control impulsive feelings and behavior, manage your emotions in healthy ways. So more often we feel we need to really do something. So self-management, think about it before you do it. You know, there's the whole saying, you know, he shoots from the hip, you know. He shoots from the hip. You know, they just say it like it is, or they carry their hearts on their sleeve, you know. Those are emotional people, right? Self-management, you must manage those emotions, right? You must be able to, to manage those emotions in a healthy way. Self-awareness, recognize those emotions and how they affect your thoughts and behavior. So before you shoot from the hip, recognize that emotion and how it affects your thoughts and behavior. Right? Social awareness, you must have empathy. You must, you must, empathy, you must be able to feel for people, right? You must understand their emotions, their needs as a leader, because people pick up on these emotions. They can pick up, right? So for you to, to be able to have them rallying behind you, they mu you must be able to, to, pick, to sense the emotion of the group. Then you respond accordingly, right? 
you can't just respond the way you want to respond. So you must always understand the group and then the group dynamics and then use that to respond. Uh, social awareness, you must have empathy. We touched on that. Relationship management, right? You must be able to maintain relationships. Build good relationships between your staff, you know, your employees, you know, generally all the stakeholders. So as a leader, you must be able to have good relationship management. Right? It's very important to maintain relationships within the business, both internally within the business as well as externally. Right? Relationships can even result in you getting discounts. You know, you walk into a store, you know, you you you, you interact, you know, that really helps with regards to uh, relationship, they know who you are. Uh, in more often than not, you will see the benefits. Excuse me, of relationship management. Right. So look at those aspects, uh, and look at yourself. You know, are they are they things that you relate to? Are they things that you know you you possess? If not, you need to look at your emotional intelligence going forward with regards to how you handle, you know, when the farm workers say they want a meeting, emotions are high, people want salary increases, people are not happy with what's going on. You need as a leader to assess and have the ability to calm those emotions down by mere fact that they see you as a calm person. Not to also get worked up and join into the frenzy. So that's aspects that one needs to be self-aware or aware of their own actions or how they react so that others can pick up on, on those uh, um, emotion, emotional traits. Right. right. What is the relationship between emotional intelligence and leadership? We've touched more, uh, most of these areas I've already touched on. But a leader with high emotional intelligence, you know, there's always that word, emotional intelligence, right? So these are the aspects that one must possess um, to obviously be able to manage emotions or to be able to have emotions that when others look up to you as a leader, you know, they, they, they feel you're empathetic to their cause. You are listening, right? So the top five characteristics of emotional leaders based on scholars' research they're self-aware, they pause, they slow down, right? Remember, we mentioned, do not immediately fight fire with fire, right? They do not react to situations immediately. They think about how they react, right? They're firm but fair, right? They stay control of their emotions, right? Self-regulation, right? They motivate, right? They're able to motivate others to be able to follow their vision. So you must be able to, you know, move a group from being on the extreme left, for example. You must motivate them to come to the middle, right? Based on just, you know, being empathetic, we speak of empathetic. Right? The, the, the people you lead must be able to see that you do see things their way, right? You do hear them out. And one, one, one thing, never say, I hear you before you actually say something to someone. It actually, it actually means I don't actually hear you. I just want to get my, my point of view in, right? So empathy, right? Social skills. You must have good social skills, right? The art of making emotional connection, right? Social skills. Uh, this you may need to practice. Then, you know, not, not everyone may necessarily have the same social skills. But as a leader, you need to work on your social skills. So just think of those five characteristics. Um, you know, are they something that you have or this is something you need to work on? But emotional intelligence as a leader is important and for you to improve on your emotional intelligence, you need to work on some of these aspects, if not all of them. Right. Okay, leaders. Leaders communicate a lot. They communicate both internally in the group, I mean, in the company, as well as externally with stakeholders, right? So effective communication is very important as a leader. 
to be able to communicate effectively to both your staff, your workers, stakeholders, your management, right? Okay, so if it, what what is effective communication and how can we improve communication, right? So the transmission of information and meaning from one individual group to another, that's communication, right? So leaders typically communicate in five distinct steps, right? So they have the idea that they need to convey. So you will have, as a leader, you'll have an idea that you need to convey to your staff, right? You need to assess whether that idea will be capable of being understood. So you need to assess who your audience is, right? Communicating in a listed company, for example, may be different to communicating in a one-man business, right? So you need to understand the context, right, by which you are communicating, right? You then encode the idea in a message, right? So it may be a complex idea, the language that will convey meaning. So you need to suit the message to the audience so that they accept, they, they can understand it easier, right? Okay. Then you need to choose how you will communicate. Will you call the group? Will you address them directly? Will you send an email? Will you write a memo? Will you write a WhatsApp text or post on a group? Depends, right? Depends on the importance on who the people are, the resources they have, where they are. There's lots of con consideration that you think of, right? And then the follower receives and calls the message. The receiver of the message needs to have a key cipher. Okay, that's, that's a bit complex, but the, the, the essence is the person must be able to decode whatever you're saying. So you can't send an email to people that don't have emails, right? You can't communicate in English to people that don't understand English. Right? So that's what we're saying, right? The follower provides feedback to the, lead, to the leader that confirms that they understand. So as you communicate, you must be able to obtain feedback that your communication is being understood, right? You communicate, there must be feedback. Otherwise you will communicate and then when you finish, you realize either the training button is not recording, for example, <laughs> or you can then just give feedback to people that never really understood what you were saying. So think about this as you communicate to your farm workers, your staff, you have your idea, how are you going to communicate? Are you going to sit with the group? Will there be disruptions when you sit with the group? Do you rather just send someone Will they, or do you just send a note, right? But you must follow these steps because they will prompt you to think about how you're communicating. They will prompt you to say, think about the mode of communication, right? Think about simplifying the information and think about, are they giving you feedback, right? Right, module some, module five, right? Let's move on, right? Believing in something, right? What are we talking about here, right? We're talking about the importance of exploring personal values, leadership, courage, resilience, the importance of developing resilience and persistence, right? The importance of the leader's role in defining the future of the operation, strategic planning and leadership. So again, leading change, right? That's what we're talking about, right? Let's start with values. What are values? Maybe as a group, um, not as a group, as individuals. Just type what you think what is values? What, what are your values? Type your three values that you say, these are my values that I live by, right? Let's type, right? So as a leader, we need to talk about how you develop as a leader, right? So leadership is more than the accumulation of knowledge and experience and skills. It is also desire, conviction, and will. So there's an aspect of no, knowledge and skill that leads you to being a leader, but there's also personal aspects, the drive, the desire that comes from within, right? That is not necessarily learned or experienced, 
but that is part of the knowing self, right? So we speak of courage, right? Moral courage, the ability to use inner principles to do what is good for others, right? Moral, yeah, moral, morals, right? The ability to use inner principles to do what is good, regardless of threat to self. Right? You must have the courage to do what is right as a leader. So it may not be the popular thing, it may not be the safest thing, but it must be the right thing. You must have that courage. You must have the desire to develop resistance and persistence. And what is resistance? It's a positive coping trait that is attributed to an individual's ability to persist in the face of adversity. So as a leader, there will be hardships. There will be hard decisions that must be made. So leaders must be resilient and must be persistent. You must be able to live through the cycles of hardships. You must be able to lead. Right? There's no point in you as a leader being the first one that buckles under pressure because your followers will look at you. They look towards the leader for guidance. So resilience, persistence, leaders must be resilient and persistent, right? You must cover the future. You must be able right, to see beyond the mountain, right? So as a leader, you must not just focus on the here and now, but the tomorrow, right? The people you lead may not see the tomorrow, they may see the here and now. So that's why that persistence and resilience is also important because you're dealing with the behind the mountain that people may, the over the mountain that people may not necessarily see today, right? So hard decisions may have to be made today for a better tomorrow. That's what we're saying. But again, you must have a clear vision right, that turns values into action, right? So development as a leader. So that's how we develop as leaders, right? We look at our courage, our resilience, and our ability to shape the future, right? We move to, before we move to honesty, right? Development as leaders. Where in the development cycle do you see yourself with regards to these aspects? You know, do you tick all the boxes? Are there areas that you need to look at? So think about that in your own business. Right. The next module we'll look at is module six, which is honesty and integrity. We'll take a five minutes break, then we'll continue with this module.
Okay, welcome back. Okay, welcome back everyone. We'll now move to module six, which is honesty and integrity. That's what we'll touch on. So we're gonna to touch on leadership and morals, integrity and honesty, All right? Leadership morals, All right? Leadership morals refer to a leader's conduct that exemplifies strong moral values, selfless and integrity. So under here, we're talking about the leader having good values that are generally accepted by society as working for the overall good of the community, right? What are the characteristics of this moral leadership that the leaders should have? They should have high emotional intelligence. We spoke of emotional intelligence, right? It's one of the most significant characteristics of moral leadership. They must have integrity, right? They must be driven by values. Right. So those are the three aspects that we, we talk of when we talk of characteristics of moral leadership. Remember emotional intelligence. We spoke of the attributes that leaders must have to drive emotional intelligence, right? Integrity, right? They must be honest and dependable, right? Driven by values, right? They must have their own principles, values that are aligned to the organization they must stay true to them right so what culture supports these morals right within the organization so you must have a organizational culture that's aligned to morals right so that's what we're saying corporate culture is defined as the beliefs and behaviors that determine how a company employees and management interact and handle business transactions right they can develop organically over time right so corporate culture, so as an organization, right? It's one thing to have leaders and morals, right? So it's one thing to have the leaders having those characteristics of moral leadership, but the culture within the organization must also drive moral leadership. So you can't have just the leaders being moral, having leadership morals, but the organization culture itself does not drive that aspect, right? So the two, work hand in hand, right? Um, on here, we talk of leadership and code of ethics. So a code of ethics essentially drives corporate culture. It, it drives culture within the organization, right? So that's where we talk of leadership and code of ethics, right? So typically that code of ethics is what governs corporate culture in the organization. So to be a document that stays, this is the values of the organization. Uh, it talks of corruption, ethical conduct, ethical and uh, ethical conduct, right? It talks of the directives of personal and professional behavior. So, so th those are the aspects that will be in the code of ethics. So you can choose as an organization to have a formal code of ethics, which is a handwritten paper that's stuck on the wall, nicely laminated, that says, you know, these are the, the values we aspire by, this is how we will behave, right? And people, when they join, they can sign that code of ethics that I will commit to these things. Or it can just be entrenched in how you run the organization, right? Right, walking the talk, right? Leadership and transparency. So leaders can formally and informally support the development of their followers through leading by example. Right. We spoke of leaders leading by example, right? You must walk the talk, right? Your followers must be able to see that what you say is what you do, right? You must, we spoke of, we speak of honest conversation, right? Despite the difficulty of having what is referred to as an honest conversation, it is better for followers and superiors to hear the truth. You must be able to tell them like it is, right? Remember, we spoke of courage, right? Having courage as a leader, that is what we're talking about, right? So it is recommended that you must be open in all communication. You must tell people what needs to be done. You must give them the opportunity to digest what you've said. 
Right? You must be transparent as a leader. All right. We'll move to module seven. Right? Before we move to seven, think about that. Are you a transparent leader? Do you practice transparency as a leader? All right, module seven, self-awareness. All right, what are we talking about here? After completing this module, right, you will talk of explore self in relation to becoming an effective leader. You must understand self-efficacy, uh, personal characters, your own personal characters and traits, self-esteem, confidence. So we are now dealing with you as an individual, self-awareness. Uh, um, right? So self-awareness is defined as the ability to focus on yourself and how your actions, thoughts, or emotions do or don't align with your internal standards, right? So think about yourself, right? And think about your company and think about effective leadership and think about power, right? So by now you already know or have an idea of what kind of a leader you are what kind of a leader you need to be, which leadership style is the best for yourself, and where you stand on aspects like emotional intelligence. So based on that, you have some, you, you now have some level of self-awareness, right? So ask yourself the following questions. Right? Who am I? What do I stand for? What do I know? What don't I know? What have I to offer? Do I believe in myself? What happens if I fail? Who would want to follow me? Why would anyone want to follow me? Now that you have context of leadership from when we started, let's ask ourselves those questions, right? So that we are self-aware, right? You now know where you need to improve or what works best for you, <clears throat> right? Self-efficacy. Right. What is self-efficacy? Right. Um, so a key character of a transformational leader is self-efficacy or internal control. Right. So a key characteristic of leaders is self-efficacy or internal control. Right. Excuse me. Self-efficacy and self-confidence are they the same? Right. Right. The ability to control yourself. Right. Remember when we spoke of Emotional intelligence, we spoke of the ability to control self, right? So you must always look at the links of these aspects, right? Dealing with failure. In many ways, how do we deal with failure is more important than how we deal with success. So as a leader, how you deal with failure, do you learn from failure? Remember, a failure experience is a learning experience, right? Success is success. It can reinforce what you already know, but failures show you what you don't know. Right? Always know that. When you deal with failure, always take it as a learning point. Right? All right. Confidence. Right? We speak of self efficacy dealing with failure. Now we speak of confidence. When you fail, when you stand in front of others, when you lead, right? How confident are you when you say make decisions? Right? So what is confidence to you? Right? What are your personal traits that drive self-confidence? I know we speak of confidence always. Right? What are your personal traits that hinder self-confidence? Right? Would you be described as a confident person or not? So think about these points. Right? Let's think about these points in relation to us as leaders. You know, do we exude confidence that someone will say, yes, we are being led, we're in good hands? If not, what are the personal traits that we need that hinder this self-confidence? And how can we move from being not confident to being confident? Okay. Right, we'll move to module eight. Right. 
where we're going to touch on knowledge, wisdom, and intelligence, right? Not emotional, but intelligence, right? Let's talk, start by talking about credibility, right? I'm sure you've all heard, heard the word, your reputation precedes you, right? So before people actually see or hear you speak, they may already have heard something about you and they already have a judgment or a box that they've already placed you in. So regardless of what you eventually say, right? So that's what we mean, your reputation precedes you. That's why your reputation is important to make you or break you even before you start, right? So many things contribute to credibility, right? So you're credible based on probably previous history or track record, right? So if you are known for keeping to your word, the people will give you the benefit of the doubt when you start that you will keep to your word. But if you're known for not keeping to your word, they'll probably not listen to what you're saying, right? So the track record of the person delivering the message is very important, right? The content of the message, if it's blatantly obvious that the message you're delivering is incorrect, right? it will impact your credibility. The communicator's reputation, right? Again, your reputation precedes you. Are you known for being trustworthy? Right? Are you consistent? What you do versus what you say, right? That will contribute to your credibility. So as a business leader, you must be credible. And how are you credible? Right? You must have a track record of keep being a credible person. Whatever you deliver, the content, right? you, must, you must remember we spoke of power information, that information must always be true, accurate. You must not spread or be known to spread false news, for example. Right? You must be consistent between what you do and what you say, right? And then the second aspect, right, that affects credibility, right? Looking and feeling and acting the part, right? Part of leadership is its relationship to body language and projection. So you must, as you stand in front of the people, your body language, your projection must be able to give some sense of credibility to them. And, you know, much as it may not be the right thing, you must also, the way you dress, for example, yeah, your appearance, that right, can impact your credibility. And you know the saying, it is impossible to wear clothes without transmitting social signals. Every costume tells a story, often a very subtle one about its wearer. So we close with that on credibility, right? Right. Okay, so experts and technical leaders, right? Technical, technical leadership is more common with management than leadership. Right? Yet this aspect of leadership still completely undermines your credibility as a leader if you do not know your technical skills, right? So you cannot stand in front of people and beat them as a builder, for example, on a building project, when you yourself are not a very good builder, right? So this will also undermine your credibility, right? So as a leader, you must have some understanding or technical skills of whatever operation you're leading, right? You must know specific answers. What are the technical specifics required for the work? Can you show me how this is done? These are the questions that you will be facing. What are the rules and regulations that govern that area? How can you access resources to complete the jobs? So if you can't answer these questions that the people that you're leading, for example, are asking, then definitely your credibility will be questioned as a leader, right? Wisdom and leadership, right? Wisdom and leadership. Can the two exist together? Must you have wisdom to be a leader? And as a leader, must you or do you automatically have wisdom? Right? 
Okay, so what does wisdom mean? So wisdom comes from the old age section word for leader. Right? The assumption here is those with wisdom are leaders or leaders have wisdom. <laughs> is that true? Right? So wisdom is a combination of intelligence and experience. Right? So my question to you is, if you have wisdom, are you necessarily a leader? And vice versa, if you, are, if you are a leader, do you necessarily have wisdom? Right? So scholars refer to um, summarize wisdom literature. They've arrived at five principles of wisdom and leadership. Right? So wise leaders can formulate and understand logical arguments. Right? Wise leaders. So if you want to be a wise, not if you want, but wise leaders generally were seen to formulate and understand logical arguments, right? They are known to allow for non-rational and subjective elements when making decisions. So what we're saying here is decision-making should be dynamic. It cannot assume that things will always be the same or there's, there's a formula to things, right? Decision-making, right? Certain elements can be subjective, right? Wise leaders value humane and virtuous or higher moral outcomes. Again, morals coming in here, right? High morals when valuing decisions. They look at the, the human element, right? Emotional intelligence, right? You must be seen to be understanding people, right? Wise leaders, their actions are practical and oriented towards everyday life, practical decision. Right? Wise leaders articulate. It must be articulate. Right? So think about those five aspects and think about how you as a leader relate uh, to those five aspects. Right? Okay. So as leaders, we deal with various people. Right? Diversity. Right? Even if you look in your own farming operation, your staff is diverse. You know, their level of, of understanding is diverse. What they do is different. Their roles are different. Do you apply the same leadership style across all of them the same? Or is it specific leadership styles to different people? That's what we need to understand here. Right? So what is diversity? Right? Diversity difference. We're all different, right? And then in your groups, let's discuss how, because people are different and we're going to different leadership styles, right? We're going to put you in groups. Let's discuss what would be the challenge to manage a diverse workshop. And let's answer these questions. Would you lead them the same way, right? Do you believe that there are differing pathways to leadership? based on diversity, and what has your experience been with regards to diversity? Let's discuss that in the groups that are being put in the rooms now. Okay, All right. Now that we've touched on diversity and how different leadership styles are applicable to different groups of people. We'll now move on to module 10 that touches on stewardship, right? What is stewardship, right? right? So stewardship is the responsibility to hold in trust the wealth and resources of the organization for the greater benefit of the society. So it talks to the responsibility to be able to direct the allocation of resources, wealth and resources of the organization. So that responsibility typically resides with your boards, your management, for example. Even in your own smaller operation, the owner, you still have the responsibility to all the trust and resolve the organization for the greater benefit because they are stakeholders. It may be a one-man show, but your staff, for example, are key stakeholders that are associated with the wealth and resources of the organization. They rely on your responsibility as the one-man show owner to be able to make decisions that are in the best interest 
of the business or society. Right? So leaders are required to make decisions and take risks that affect the lives of others. So the, the decisions you make as a leader will affect the lives of your employees, their spouses, their children, and whoever else they support. So don't look at it as I only employ three farm laborers. Look at it as I'm responsible for the livelihood of the farm laborers and their extended stakeholders, the kids, their wives, their families, and whoever else they support. Right? A business leader makes decisions that affect hundreds and thousands of people. That's what we're saying. Whilst decisions made by leaders of nations can potentially affect millions, right? they rely on your decision making. Right? So to be able to make these decisions effectively, you as a leader must be a good steward. You must have the good responsibility right? to hold the trust and wealth and resources of the organization. You must understand how all elements of the organization are entrusted to you to achieve this purpose. So that's what we mean with stewardship. All right. Let's touch a bit on, on risk and leadership. So in terms of leadership, right, we've, we've, we now understand it involves us moving from one state to another. Right? It involves change. Right? Leaders are change agents. Right? But with change comes risk. So what is risk? Risk is a situational event where something of human value is at stake and where the outcome is uncertain. So risk is an outcome and is a, is a scenario where the outcome is uncertain. Right? And that uncertainty is an impact on human stake. Right? So as a leader, your role is to remove as much uncertainty from the risk process as possible. Right? And to also be prepared for the possibility of of different outcomes, right? You must understand the best possible outcome, right? You need to understand as best as possible, right, as a leader, what is at stake and other resources. In other words, what are we investing in, right? What are the areas of uncertainty? We need to know, right? And then for these areas of uncertainty, is there any way where we can find more information about these areas so that they become more certain. Then you look at what are the probabilities of failure or success right, of the change that we are proposing. Then you must have your, your contingencies for those changes. Right? You must know the worst case, best case, so that you make an informed decision. So that's why risk is very important. Okay. Balancing risk and reward. So with the risk comes reward. That's why people, or that's why managers have to make, have to take a level of risk because the reward can be gratifying for the business, right? for the greater good of the business, right? So decision-making is an important function of all Leader. They need to make a rational decision, right? How do we make rational decision? We must always establish a context for success. We must get the right people participating in the decision process, right? Feedback, stakeholders, management, they need to be involved in the decision-making process so that more heads result in better decision-making, right? We must know what the issue is. We must frame the problem statement correctly, right? We know, need to know what the problem is exactly so that we have the right solutions. If we don't understand the problem, we won't have the right solution. There must be alternatives. We need to have alter, alternatives, range of ideas, you know, second a backup plan so that we just don't follow one direction, which may not be right. We must always have alternative plans, right? We must evaluate each alternative to make sure that it's aligned to what we need to do. 
then you choose the best alternative. Right? Think of your own business and your own decision making, how you apply it in your own business. Has decision making been effective? Have you been choosing the best alternatives? And if you apply the, the steps above, does that improve your decision making in your business? All right. Okay. So we've reached the end of our effective leadership module. Um, I trust you've all benefited from what we've, we've, we've disseminated. Um, additional reading material has been provided. So I urge you to add on to your knowledge through additional reading material that we've shared on the class. Um, we will now schedule the final exam, right? Just to touch on key aspects that we've, we've rolled out during this module. So just remember, um, to prepare well, manage your time, uh, ensure good connectivity, okay. then you should be fine in the exam. Otherwise, thank you very much and good luck. <laughs>